And thank you, Eric, for doing this. Um, uh, I'm very excited by uh, this occasion where we are going to be able to discuss your, your new book. Um, Eric uh, came to us. Uh, I met him when he was doing his master's degree in technology policy at MIT, where he was concentrating on, if you want to call it, economic data science. Uh, he took my advanced course at the Kennedy School did uh, spectacularly well, innovated in a bunch of things, did things that other people couldn't do. So we hired him and we put him in a dual function, both working with the academic team in, in trying to push uh, the boundaries of knowledge and, and the applied team trying to work on specific countries. He, he did a remarkable job working on the projects in Western Australia and Jordan and Colombia. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and that's what I asked him to do. But in his spare time, uh, he he wrote a book, uh, and uh, in, uh, and it's quite an impressive uh, piece of work. Um, uh, so, uh, without any further ado, I I mean the issue of of populism and the causes of populism and and what to do if we wanted to prevent populism and preserve democracy is you know a top issue. Uh, in many, many countries, including the US, uh, less so in his native Canada. Uh, and, uh, and I think the, the contrast between the two countries is, is constantly in his mind and, and informed a lot of what the book ended up finding in an exercise with a lot of data, a lot of data science and trying to make the data confess. So without any further ado, let me let Eric tell his spiel. Well, thank you both to Ricardo and to Chuck for those very kind introductions. Um, I've got a presentation here that I am going to share. There we go, got the slide decks there. So um, as was mentioned, the title of the book is Reclaiming Populism, How Economic Fairness Can Win Back Disenchanted Voters. Uh, this is a project that my co-author, who uh, is Paul Somerville, an adjunct professor at the University of Victoria's Gustafson School of Business, uh, he and I started working on this about three years ago uh, when we sort of observed a lot of the political reactions to populism in the US and the UK uh, and compared it to our, our native country of Canada. And we sort of felt that there were reasons that uh, these sorts of things were not transpiring in places like Canada and other countries as well. You can think Australia, uh, arguably Japan, the Scandinavian countries. Uh, and so we set out to write a book to try and differentiate why we think that is precisely. So I, I'd like to begin by uh, giving an overview of the book and what differentiates it from a lot of the other discourse on populism. Uh, and then we're going to give uh, sort of three main body arguments of the book. First, how economic unfairness leads to populism. Second, the policy inputs to a fairer economy. And third, how to diagnose constraints to social mobility. And then we'll follow up with a conclusion with some high level takeaways uh, about the book's message and how it can be relevant for anybody who is concerned about populist movements around the globe. Uh, let's begin with an overview of the book. Now, the typical book on populism cites how worrisome its leaders are, such as some of these gentlemen on the right here. And it tends to offer typically some sort of long-standing political concern as an explanation for voters' motives. Things like there being too many poisonous ideas in society uh, or too many foreigners, or too much income and wealth inequality. And what I really want to emphasize is that the book Reclaiming Populism sharply diverges from that existing conversation. We instead argue that the extant debate really fails to capture the legitimate economic unfairness that citizens are really angry at. And importantly, that that unfairness is not the same thing as simple income and wealth inequality. It also stands out because it offers detailed and actionable policy advice on how to fix the root issues of economic unfairness that substantiate populism around the world. So all being told, reclaiming populism argues that populism strikes hardest when the economy is unfair. It contends that a fair and socially mobile economy is possible through equal opportunity and fair unequal outcomes. And it shows how to diagnose which missing policy inputs most constrain social mobility in a given country. Uh, let's delve right into that content with the first element of the argument, how economic unfairness leads to populism. 
So this here is a diagram essentially of the argument or the causal model that we have in mind, where the beginning of it is a pool of policy failures. And those in turn lead to two problems that uh, really are the core of what we're talking about when we talk about economic unfairness. And that's opportunity being less equal and reward being less according to contribution. It's uh, notable, importantly, that these things are not the same as whether outcomes, economic outcomes are simply equal or unequal. Those problems in turn create uh, two really concrete consequences, persistently low social mobility and also high vulnerability to economic shocks. So you can imagine that whether you have an unlucky start in life or if you've been knocked down by an economic shock, these kinds of problems of economic unfairness make it very hard for citizens in precarious economic positions to get ahead on their own merits, on their own talents and effort. That in turn leads to the perception of an unfair system in need of perhaps forceful correction, uh, and in turn the impetus for populism and populist uh, solutions, solutions quote unquote, that offer um, stark alternatives to the status quo. In order to take this kind of model seriously or this argument seriously, I'm going to break it down piece by piece and substantiate all the different parts of it. Uh, for, for the start, I'm going to skip over policy failures for now and we'll return to that later. But I really want to first address this, uh, these two issues here of economic unfairness. Why should we think that citizens are especially sensitive to economic unfairness in particular? And in fact, there is strong evidence in the behavioral science literature that people care quite a bit about fair economic outcomes in particular. And vitally, these kinds of fair economic outcomes are very different from whether outcomes are simply equal or unequal. Now, that may seem like a confusing or obtuse statement because so much of the popular discourse around economic justice assumes that all kinds of inequalities are bad and it tends to talk about fairness and inequality uh, somewhat interchangeably. So to give you a, a reason to take that idea seriously, at least from the start, here is a quote from Angus Deaton, who is a Nobel laureate in economics, who wrote uh, in an opinion piece a few years ago that inequality is not the same thing as unfairness. And to my mind, it is the latter that has incited so much political turmoil in the rich world today. Some of the processes that generate inequality are widely seen as fair, but others are deeply and obviously unfair and have become a legitimate source of anger and disaffection. And in fact, once you separate out those two ideas of equality and fairness, uh, there is good evidence, as, uh, as I said, that, um, that people are really sensitive to fairness in particular. In this paper by the uh, Yale psychologists, Starman, Sheskin, and Bloom, they write that there is no evidence that people are bothered by economic inequality itself. Rather, they are bothered by something that is often confounded or confused with inequality, economic unfairness. And having separated out those two ideas, they argue and note, for example, that one to two-year-old babies expect more resources to be allocated to those who have done more work, that six-year-olds prefer to allocate more resources to someone who has done more work, even if they have the option to allocate rewards equally, and that individuals surveyed across 16 different countries overwhelmingly prefer a decidedly unequal distribution of economic outcomes in society presumably because they understand that different people deserve different rewards depending on their contribution. And that position is hardly an outlier in the literature. And this PhD thesis from uh, Stefan Debov on the evolutionary origins of human fairness, he writes that it is well accepted in the behavioral sciences that people prefer income distributions with strong work salary correlations, prefer to give more to individuals whose input is more valuable and favor meritocratic distributions as a whole in both micro and macro justice contexts. Now in the book, we spend a whole chapter going through even more evidence uh, for what, for, um, that, that shows this is true and shows why this is. But the point here is, to, is not to dismiss uh, the importance of inequality outright. It's simply to point out that people are especially sensitive to economic unfairness and that this is a different concept from simple inequalities of income or wealth. Now, having uh, demonstrated that point, that people really are sensitive to problems of economic unfairness, naturally, the next question in this argument is, okay, well, is there proof, any uh, proof to indicate that uh, problems of economic unfairness and their consequences are actually associated with political discontent and populism, which is where, uh, you know, this, kind of, this part of the diagram starts to play a role. 
And one angle in which the uh, book addresses that problem is by looking at low social mobility. And when I say low social mobility, I'm specifically referring to a situation where individual economic success in a country or a region strongly depends on family wealth. And in that kind of situation, uh, that's a pretty clear violation of economic fairness because most people hold, I, I, I think, that uh, your family wealth is not an innate driver of your productivity. Uh, you know, it's, it's not, your, your parents do not decide your own talent and your own character and your own effort on the whole. And thus low social mobility is a fairly clear violation of economic fairness in particular. And reclaiming populism and the research uh, behind it, which is a Harvard Growth Lab working paper, demonstrates that low social mobility is in fact a robust statistical predictor of the geography of contemporary rich world populism, both across and also within high income countries. And importantly, alternative factors like income and wealth inequality, immigration and social media are not. They do not have the same systematic, statistically significant correlation in a wide variety of settings. The research behind the book linking low social mobility to populism has been cited by the EU, the UN, the IMF, the Inter-American Development Bank. It's been featured by Brookings. Uh, Professor Philip McCann, who coined the term geography of discontent, cited this research to write, uh, and I quote, that social mobility is the crucial indicator of populist voting. In addition to that angle, you could also look at the consequences of major economic shocks because uh, populist language frequently rages against the perceived unfairness of things like the global financial crisis and globalization and frames it in terms of a purportedly corrupt elite that have unfairly put their interests ahead of the rest of society. So that you can try to look at whether there are channels there by which those kinds of events and their consequences have specifically led to political shock, uh, political uh, strife through the channel of economic unfairness in particular. Uh, we go into a, a variety of evidence for this in the book, but one compelling uh, argument comes from a paper by Funke Schulerich and Trebesch on uh, the politics of financial crises from 1870 to 2014, where they find that on average, far-right parties increase their vote share by 30% after a financial crisis. Importantly, we do not observe similar political dynamics in normal recessions or after severe macroeconomic shocks that are not financial in nature. Now, to anyone coming from an economics background, uh, that ought to be a really interesting finding because you have two kinds of losses that are essentially the same in magnitude, and yet the political consequences of them are very different depending on the reasons for those shocks. And uh, to explain why that is, the authors write, what explains the more severe political fallout after financial crises? One possibility is that non-financial downturns are seen as excusable events triggered by exogenous shocks, while financial crises may be, preserved, may be perceived as endogenous and inexcusable, I might use the term unfair, the result of policy failures, moral hazard, and favoritism. Again, we go into much more evidence in the book, but this is the kind of thing that would lead, uh, would lead one to conclude that citizens turn to populism when they're fed up with an unfair economy, they feel the system is rigged and must be forcefully reset, and that other factors like social media and immigration are best understood as amplifiers rather than systematic uh, cross-cutting causes of uh, high degrees of populism across the globe. To try, that, to try and make that phenomenon a little more tangible for you, I have a quote from a swing voter uh, from the US who in 2016 ultimately voted for Donald Trump. And he was quoted in the Boston Globe as writing, I see my tax dollars going to handouts for others who didn't work as hard as I did and I can't afford my health care. Everyone is being taken care of but me. I feel left out and it makes me feel that I want my country back. This voter is evidently very concerned with the unfair, purportedly unfair relationship between contribution and reward in the United States. And the essential thesis of the book is that he's not alone. Now, if you buy that argument and uh, you understand that economic unfairness is a key contributor to populism around the globe today, uh, the next natural question is, okay, well, what can we do about it? What are the policy inputs that substantiate a fairer and more socially mobile economy? And that addresses, uh, if you recall this diagram, the first element pertaining uh, to the policy failures that lead to economic unfairness and its consequences. Something I want to clarify right from the get-go 
is that a lot of the political discourse around uh, the, the policy inputs to social mobility is not really close to the mark. You can see that uh, this diagram here on the horizontal axis, it has government spending as a share of GDP uh, in 2018 for different countries. And then on the vertical axis, it has uh, social mobility where I've arranged countries with low social mobility at the top of the graph and countries with high social mobility at the bottom. And you can see that the traditional prescriptions of we just got to have small government, get government out of the way so people can get on, or big governments have lots of interventions to fix all the problems that are there. Neither of those are really silver bullets. You can see that countries like uh, Switzerland, the US, arguably even the UK, are representative of places with relatively small governments and nevertheless uh, suffer from low social mobility. And by the same token, you have places like Italy and especially France that on the flip side have large governments and also suffer from low social mobility. So if the solution isn't quite as simple as many politicians might tell you, naturally that might lead one to ask, well, what actually are the policy inputs that really support social mobility? And we argue in Reclaiming Populism that the most socially mobile countries today use policies that specifically enable equal opportunity and fair unequal outcomes. You can think of countries like Australia, Canada, and the Nordics, the Scandinavian countries that, that pair state-sponsored equal opportunity with competitive markets. And as a consequence, they have high social mobility and they tend to be populism resistant as well. Uh, it's not an absolute uh, bulletproof screen, but it's like a firewall against populism that prevents its worst excesses. You can imagine how Australia and Canada have not had to deal with anything quite like the Trump phenomenon. The Nordic countries have not had to deal with anything quite like Brexit. And uh, in spite of the immense shock of the 2015 European migrant crisis, in fact, in the 2019 European Parliament election, uh, Denmark and Sweden voted for populists at, at rates respectively of around 10 and 13 percent, whereas the range for other countries like the UK, Italy and France was more like 30 to 50 percent. Quite a difference there. Places in, in contrast that fail on either of these categories of policy inputs tend to suffer the consequences. The United States certainly has competitive market outcomes, but on the whole, it does not support equal opportunity because it has threadbare investment in public goods compared to other countries. Uh, France, on the other hand, has a world-class social safety net. You can imagine everything from education to healthcare to transport infrastructure, but it arguably also has an overbearing state that regulates and taxes away the fruits of success which can make it very hard for people who are trying to move their way up the career ladder to actually work their way up and be rewarded according to their contribution. As a consequence of these problems, we argue, both countries suffer from low social mobility and have fierce populist movements. In turn, the policy inputs to equal opportunity and fair unequal outcomes are themselves quite complex. I've uh, got a diagram here, and if you're familiar with the Growth Lab's work, you'll notice that this is somewhat akin to a diagnostic tree. Um, now there's a lot going he on here and I promise we're going to break it down, but I want to just make some initial observations about it for you. You can see that economic fairness is at the top of the chart. You can also think of social mobility being supported there. Uh, and that in turn relies on equal opportunity and fair unequal outcomes. Those two elements in turn depend on a wide variety of categories of policy inputs that support them. You can see that equal opportunity, for example, depends on formal equal opportunity, freedom from discrimination, but also substantive equal opportunity or the ability to use public goods to become productive and access economic agglomerations. Uh, and similarly, protection against unfair events like financial crises or even ill health via healthcare. By the same token, it is just as important for countries to embrace fair unequal outcomes, which depend on the ability to reward value creation through an efficient market that in turn depends on all the inputs that are conventionally understood as the things that support economic growth. And additionally, uh, the, the need to punish cheaters through a justice system and taxation and regulation, such that unequal outcomes insofar as they occur actually are fair and that reward is really still according to contribution. Now, there's a lot going on there, but it's easier to comprehend, uh, I argue, if you imagine the life trajectory of somebody who personally experiences social mobility. You can think of somebody who is, say, born into a working class family and works their way up to become a middle class uh, plumber or accountant. It doesn't really matter if it's blue collar or white collar. But the key thing to ask is, 
what needs to happen along the way and what is the role of, uh, of the state and of policy at each of those steps. The very first thing that needs to happen is that uh, somebody um, has to be able to have the opportunity to become productive. And there, there are commonly discussed inputs that are relevant, such as access to affordable, high quality education uh, and childhood nutrition. Now, those kinds of inputs often constitute the entire policy debate on social mobility, but uh, we contend in the book that it really shouldn't because that just gets a person to the point where they are productive in theory. And as you'll see, there are a whole bunch of other steps that then need to happen to actually get them to the final destination of making it, say, to the middle class. Immediately after somebody has got that ability to become productive, they then, for example, have to be able to actually physically access hubs of economic opportunity. Um, you can think of cities or towns or simply whatever geography they need to go where they can find a job or uh, start a business. And relevant policy inputs there include things like housing and transport infrastructure. Um, you might know that these things have featured quite heavily in the recent leveling up debate in the United Kingdom uh, for good reason. Once somebody has been able to uh, become productive, physically access the location they need to get to in some way, the economy that's there has to be able to actually offer ample job and business opportunities. And this is something that is not frequently discussed in the conversation around social mobility, but we argue quite strongly in the book that this is really only possible with a competitive private sector. If you do not have a private sector so that people can find job opportunities and find opportunities to start a business, then that opportunity remains theoretical and it isn't translated to tangible success. You absolutely need an efficient market and all the inputs that support competition and economic growth to go along with that. When somebody is then competing for those kinds of opportunities insofar as they exist in society, they must be able to do so in a way that is free from discrimination for one, both in law and in culture. And they also must be able to do so in a way that is free from the influence of economic cheaters who might take away opportunities in unfair ways. You can imagine that it's no good if you're going to start a business to set up shop right next door to a monopolist or somebody who undercuts safety standards when you're really trying to get ahead simply by creating value and getting rewarded for that value creation. The entire way this occurs, society has a key, uh, or rather the state has a key role in minimizing the chance of society-wide unfair events uh, like financial crises. You can imagine the role of financial regulation taking a, a place there. Uh, and also to ensure against unavoidable perennial unfair events, things like ill health or a job loss in a cyclical downturn that can never be totally avoided, but can be mitigate, mitigated against through things like health care uh, and unemployment insurance, so that a sudden and anticipated uh, and perhaps unfair shock doesn't unfairly cut someone off from future opportunity by bankrupting them wholly. Collectively, as such, we argue in the book that there are multitudinous complementary policy inputs to social mobility. And uh, part of the consequence of that is because it, you have to get so many things right in order for social mobility to happen, uh, we argue that's a reason why very few countries actually are able to do that in practice. There's really only about half a dozen countries that are in that upper echelon of the highest social mobility in the world, even fewer than there are developed countries. And here's that uh, diagram of all the relevant uh, categories of inputs here that we argue for, just for consideration once again. Now, having established and argued for all those different inputs that are possibly relevant to, uh, to uh, social mobility, next we wanna take things to the lens of a policymaker who is looking to uh, reform social mobility and uh, uh, you know, boost social mobility in their particular country. And that's where it becomes very important to diagnose the top constraints to social mobility on a place-by-place -place basis. Now, vitally, we see these inputs to social mobility as complements and not substitutes. And what that means is that, for example, you cannot fix a terrible education system by investing more in transport infrastructure, and the vice versa is also true. You have to actually fix your failing schools, and you have to actually fix your failing trains. You can't just swap them out for each other. And the consequence of that is that it is critical for policymakers to diagnose which missing inputs most severely constrain social mobility in a given country. And the reason for that is so that your reform efforts don't go off in some tangent or some area where you're perhaps already doing relatively well when there's some other failing area that you're doing very badly on and is really holding back social mobility on the whole. That makes that story of somebody going from the working class to the middle class impossible in some way. 
And in order to uh, do that, we take a leaf from the uh, Harvard Growth Labs diagnostic method, uh, which uh, you know, of course, is, is uh, hosting this talk and, and where I work. Um, and there are a variety of detailed steps that are involved in the diagnostic method and some tweaks when you need to apply it to the question of social mobility, which we go through in detail in the book. Uh, unfortunately, it is a bit technical, so I can't cover all of it today, but uh, I want to present sort of the core idea of the uh, diagnostic method, method, which is to home in on the most severe or binding constraints to an economic output. And those tend to be both highly desired and also scarce. And as a consequence, you can look for signals in the data that something tends to be in low supply and high demand in various ways. To give one quick example of the kinds of analysis uh, you might look for and the kind of data signals you might look for, we can consider the question, very hot topic in the UK today, does leveling up regional infrastructure actually make a difference? Is this really likely to improve economic opportunity in the regions of Britain apart from London? Now, first, you might turn to the question of supply and try to figure out whether there is a low supply of infrastructure in those regions. And a starting point there might be to recognize that the UK has, on the whole, arguably undersupplied infrastructure investment across the nation. This is a graph of the average uh, government gross fixed capital investments in G7 countries as a share of GDP uh, from 1995 to 2015. And you can see that the UK is second to last and lags behind uh, a couple of important comparator countries like Canada and the United States and France. Uh, so on the whole, there's uh, perhaps reason to think that infrastructure is undersupplied in the UK overall. But in addition to that, there's further evidence that it is especially undersupplied in regions. Coyle and Sensier in a 2019 paper showed that many infrastructure projects that were approved in London had, had in fact lower cost benefit ratios than those rejected in regions. And what that means is that that infrastructure investment that is already scarce in the UK as a whole is especially concentrated in London and therefore doubly scarce in regions. So that's you know maybe not a complete and thorough uh, analysis of everything you could do to address that question, but that's the kind of evidence you would look for to indicate uh, that uh, something like uh, regional infrastructure investment is in low supply. And then you want to turn to the question of demand. Is this also in high demand? Because if it is, then expanding that supply will create large payoffs. Uh, in the case of regional infrastructure in the UK, one piece of evidence you might consider is a 2019 Ernst & Young survey of foreign investors, where they asked these foreign investors, what's your top decision factor for investing in UK regions? And the survey showed that transport and technological infrastructure was in fact the top decision factor ahead even of the availability of uh, local skills in the labor force. Uh, now, of course, these investors are the kinds of people that would uh, be bringing in new business, new economic opportunities uh, in the region so that people can you know, work their way up the career ladder and, and be rewarded according to their contribution. And thus, this is a vital indicator uh, to indicate that regional infrastructure in the UK, uh, better regional infrastructure in the UK is in fact highly demanded. Uh, as a consequence, this is some of the evidence that you might use to conclude that regional infrastructure in the UK is in both low supply and high demand. It's therefore plausible that it is a binding constraint to social mobility and expanded economic opportunity in the UK. Um, now, after identifying that kind of issue as a binding constraint, you might want to ask, well, that's kind of a weird situation. Why is it that something is stuck in low supply and high demand? Because usually that is corrected either by market forces or by people going to the ballot box and you know, essentially getting angry about it. Um, and in turn, you might ask, well, why is there that bad equilibrium? Is there a political economy syndrome that explains why the regional UK is exhibiting those symptoms? Uh, in the case of the UK, um, we make an argument in, in the book essentially for fiscal over-centralization. Uh, you can see this graph here shows on the uh, horizontal axis the log of population. And then on the vertical axis, it has the share of government investment that's conducted by central government. Essentially, the infrastructure spend and other kinds of spending that are conducted by central government versus regional and local government. And you can see, sorry, you can see that there is no other large high income country apart from the UK uh, that spends uh, so much of its investment at the level of central as opposed to regional and local government. The UK is a definite outlier in that regard. Uh, and the same pattern shows up if you look at the taxation side. 
This uh, graph is similar, but on the vertical axis, it shows the share of taxes collected at the level of central government as opposed to regional and local. And once again, the UK is a clear uh, outlier. So both its tax collection and its spending are quite concentrated at the level of central government, which could explain why uh, there is so little uh, infrastructure investment in the regions that's so sorely needed. In the book, we consider uh, other issues as well, things like the state of healthcare and education being unaffordable in the US and how that contributes to social mobility. Uh, things like the um, overbearing taxation and regulation regimes in France that arguably prevent people from working their way up the economic ladder and constrained labor markets and tax administration in Italy. And we go into more detail about the UK as well. This is sort of just a taste of, of uh, what's possible. So with that uh, in mind, I'd like to conclude the presentation part of this event with a couple of key thoughts that uh, we think are relevant to anyone who is concerned about the state of populism around the uh, globe today. And the first of those is don't mischaracterize populist voters as uniformly deplorable, stupid, and racist. This is too often a perception of, of uh, those kinds of voters, but in fact, uh, those voters also notoriously complain about a rigged system and the data indicates that they have a point that economic unfairness, low social mobility and other problems associated with economic unfairness are in fact tightly associated with the incidence of populism. And because populism is grounded in very real entrenched economic unfairness, importantly, it cannot be simply beaten down and defeated. You can't just excoriate that segment of the population and hope the problem will go away. It's systematically entrenched. The only option is to reclaim the populist vote by substantively rectifying the very real economic unfairness that drives it. In turn, the way in which you do that is very important. The messaging and policy to win back the populist vote must be precisely targeted at a fairer economy and the place specific binding constraints that underpin it. And this messaging and policy cannot be confused with conflicting and unfair ideological goals like aggressive redistribution or laissez-faire neoliberalism. You can imagine, for example, how uh, in the UK, Jeremy Corbyn's platform completely imploded uh, when he was offering a hard left alternative to the status quo. Uh, and as some journalists have noted, it's, it's because uh, these voters really didn't want uh, equalization. They saw that as unfair and everybody gets the same regardless of their contribution when really most people want the chance to get on. And on the flip side, you can think of issues associated with laissez-faire neoliberalism. Uh, where you take the position that, you know, the market is always right, even if it's unfair. Um, for example, you can think of Tony Blair's famous quote, where he said that some people ask whether we ought to stop and debate globalization. We might as well stop and debate whether autumn ought to follow summer. Now, however, by the uh, quote that might have been, uh, to many voters that ignored the very real consequences that globalization can have for them, if it's ex executed under conditions where those affected citizens do not have new opportunities uh, to adjust and to find new paths to success. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening to the presentation today. Uh, Reclaiming Populism is available on Amazon, on my publisher's website, politybooks.com, and in bookstores uh, everywhere. And I'm, I'm looking forward to Q&A, both with Ricardo and with the audience. Thank you so much. Great. That was... Uh quite an impressive uh, synthesis and and you you must have uh, planned it very well because we were just on time so thank you <laughs> thank you very much before i go to the q and a let me ask you a couple of questions i can imagine a world where social mobility um, can also cause problems so, i mean if you start in a situation where say uh, some groups of people say um, Black people, minorities, women, uh, you know, start with a, a, a lower share of, of, of the pie, uh, lower wages and so on, and, and they progress, um, that the, the people who used to be uh, higher up in the ranks might get uh, concerned, uh, uh, worried, etc. And that I, I could interpret that some of the malaise in parts of, of the populist vote is, is that you know, the gap between black and white, between men and women has been narrowing. And uh, especially for people with less than high school education. 
uh, would you say that that uh, there there might be some? Um, is it all is social mobility always good, or or is social mobility in some sense uh, uh, puts people? Uh, I mean, for everyone that goes up, somebody got, comes down in the ranking, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, what happens to the people that come down in the ranking when there's a lot of social mobility? Is, uh, uh, will they develop a discourse to? in some sense, entrench their previous rank and that they, they will favor, uh, uh, you know, policies that, that would uh, prevent them from moving down? Certainly. So uh, that if people in the audience are looking for an expanded version of that argument, I'd refer them to uh, the book Identity by Francis Fukuyama, which essentially makes that argument that it's a matter of status threat that's driving populism around the world. The, you know, traditional uh, you know, think, think like white, blue collar men feel threatened by the rise of these uh, new minorities and these new immigrants that are, are gaining power. Um, I, I would say that, uh, for, I mean, first of all, the, the data doesn't support the idea that low social mobility is negatively, um, sorry, the, the data doesn't support the contention that social mobility is negatively associated with populism. It, it's quite clear that worse social mobility is systematically associated with worse populism, so it doesn't really play out empirically. But uh, if, if you want to address the question from a more of a qualitative angle, I would say that uh, it's important to conceive of this, at least in my view, in the sense that social mobility isn't a zero sum game. It's, it's not like, uh, you know, some people necessarily uh, lose out uh, when, when other people win. It, it, it's more, the, the way I think of it more is about a system of uh, complex cooperation, where if you have other people who are given the opportunity to be productive, that actually makes you better off. And, uh, you, you know, the, the way that I see the frustration uh, surrounding populism is not so much that, that people are worried that there are these other minorities that uh, might surpass them. It's, it's uh, more akin to that, um, that quote from the Boston Globe that I, I uh, shared, where, you know, you have people who feel that they have worked really hard, they can't afford their health care. They, they um, feel like they're being left, left behind, essentially. Um, so so I, I think that uh, people are perhaps less uh, antagonistic towards uh, the, these you know, perceived status threats than, uh, than, than is uh, frequently claimed. And that it's, it's, it's more uh, about uh, these individuals feeling that they aren't being rewarded. Interesting, interesting. Um... Also, uh, I mean, Canada, Australia are two countries where immigration rates are much higher than, say, in the U.S. or France. Yeah. Um, why do you think uh, um, immigration uh, is so much of an issue in, in, in the populist discourse in, in, say, the U.S. and, and the U.K.? And, and, and why, why does it not take hold in, in Canada and Australia? Yeah, that's um, so that, that's something we address at length in the book. But the, the basic argument is that in a situation of economic unfairness, where you have people who are you know already there who feel like they're not being rewarded, they're not getting the opportunities and support that they need to have, then when you have a mass immigration coming in or, or a refugee shock or what have you, uh, it's easy for that lead to, to lead to a situation where people perceive those newcomers as getting help when they feel that they're, they're not getting help. Uh, there was a fantastic quote in The Economist a couple of years ago, for example, where they interviewed uh, uh, populist voters in uh, East Germany. And they uh, essentially were interviewing them about this immigration question. And the, um, the, the way they synthesized the respondents' uh, answers was that we, like, we, they really hated it when people classified them as racist. They really felt that they weren't racist. And their concern was that they felt like they were being left behind and that newcomers were being helped first. Um, and one of the consequences of, of that is that you, you can have these uh, xenophobic spillovers in places that are affected by low social mobility and economic unfairness. And in contrast, you can look at places like the Scandinavian countries where they had a huge migration shock uh, there was a bit of a populist moment and, and the vote share in national level elections, even uh, I think in Sweden went as high as 20% for populists, but uh, it, it, you know, there was nothing like Brexit uh, and the, the vote shares in the European Parliament election came down quite a bit. 
So overall, uh, we see immigration as potentially an amplifier, something that can make the problem of economic fairness seem worse. But uh, we, we don't see it as really a systematic cause that's leading to the highest echelons of populism around the world. Um. Uh, I mean, but still, uh, I mean, the difference, you know, the U.S. is at about 14 percent, Canada is about 24 percent. Is there something about immigration policy itself that, that might be uh, different? Or, I mean, uh, do you think Canada and the U.S. have the same impact on, I mean, immigration is always a, a challenge to the perception of social fairness or, or, or uh, you know, people might... I mean, is it, is it something about the preferences of the Canadians or is it something about uh, immigration system that the Canadians have, the differential system that the Canadians have vis-a-vis -vis the U.S.? Well, OK, I mean, there, there's sort of two things I, I would know. First is that both subnationally and internationally, it, you know, we don't see a clear correlation between immigration rates in practice, whatever the system behind it might be, and the consequential populism. But I would add that uh, you know, certainly insofar as that immigration system can amplify uh, whatever, whatever, you know, uh, threats are there concerning economic unfairness, um, I, I think there's certainly an argument that it can be amplified more if you have an immigration system that people perceive to be unfair. If you have, uh, you know, uh, for example, a point system like Canada, where you're uh, bringing in lots of very high skilled immigrants, um, there might be more of a perception that those immigrants are coming in and contributing uh, to the system. Uh, whereas if you have, uh, you know, plenty of, uh, you know, refugees or low skill immigrants or illegal immigrants coming in, uh, it, it could be the opposite perception that, that people could become especially sensitive to that concern, uh, you know, in a situation where they feel like they're already being unfairly treated. And then they see these people who are coming in essentially you know, in their view, breaking rules to enter the country. Okay. Uh, we have a, a question at the core of your thesis uh, in, in, in the Q&A um, from Julio Cesar Martinez. And he asks whether you've thought about whether uh, economic unfairness could explain populist leaders in Latin America. Great question. So uh, one thing I would say is that uh, to an extent, the, the book certainly argues that the problem of economic unfairness is a near universal concern. We explain in the book how both biological and cultural evolution press people to value fairness because it enables complex co cooperation. And uh, thus, I certainly would expect that people ought to be sensitive to economic unfairness in Latin America, and that it could very well be a contributor to a problem there. I, I, uh, my my co-author and I wrote in our, a uh, letter to the Financial Times about um, uh, populism in Chile on that uh, specifically. Uh, that being said, our uh, analysis on the whole is concentrated on high income countries uh, for, for two reasons. Firstly, because it is perhaps so troublesome that so many uh, beacons of global freedom like the US and uh, the UK and France have uh, been susceptible to a liberal populism, uh, but also because um, in a lot of other parts of the world, and, you know, it's, it's not especially surprising that support for democracy is uh, not as, as pronounced. There are long histories of troubled demagoguery in lots of these countries uh, and, and a wide variety of associated problems that occur there. Um, so on, on the whole, I would say that uh, it's very plausible that, there, that it could be a contributing factor. Uh, there might be other things going on there as well, more related to the you know, deep political history of the countries in question. Uh, very good. Um... Uh, uh, Mohammed asks uh, uh, an interesting question. Uh, uh, do you have a guess? I mean, obviously, there's economic uh, um, uh, unfairness and economic inequality. I mean, uh, you argue that there might be uh, unequal but fair outcomes. Yes. But there might be also inequality that is the consequence of unfairness. Mm -hmm. Do you have a guess or have to explore this question of how much of the economic inequality is the consequence of economic unfairness versus uh, sort of like fair but unequal? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's interesting you ask that because uh, while I haven't, you know, personally explored that question, we do talk about other authors who have. Uh, and, and one common approach in the literature is to do something called inequality composition, uh, decomposition where they take the, uh, the existing income distribution in a society 
and they essentially statistically decompose it. And they say, okay, what portion of that is arguably unfair because it's explained by uh, demographic determinants that really shouldn't determine your success. Things like your ethnicity, your race, your, uh, your gender, your place of birth, your parental wealth, uh, your uh, parental education, uh, you know, all those kinds of factors. Um, one really interesting finding was that um, the growth of inequality in the US, uh, this is from, from a paper, I think by uh, Hufa, Kember and Peekle, um, the growth of income inequality in the US was largely uh, fair for the most part from 1970 to 1990, insofar as most of that income inequality could not be explained by these unfair components. But thereafter, since about 1990, it's become more and more unfair. Uh, another really interesting angle on that comes from uh, Sergei Guriev, who's the chief economist of the uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, um, where he did a paper doing the same kind of income uh, inequality decomposition for different post-Soviet countries and EDRD countries. And he found that the unfair components of income inequality was associated with less support for markets and democracy. But once you take that into account, the remaining fair components of income inequality is associated with higher support. Um, so uh, that, that's, that's a yeah, interesting question. And it's certainly uh, the evidence that's available indicates that things are, are trending in a bad direction. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, uh, we have a question about um, uh, what do you think about citizens' wealth funds? Would you see the establishment of these kinds of vehicles in resource-rich developing countries as an antidote to populism? As if, if, if the money, in some sense, if, if individuals could claim property rights on, 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 on the natural resource rents instead of having them channeled through the budget? So I, I guess this is uh, actually somewhat akin to questions we sometimes get about universal basic income in the United States. I, I guess the idea here is you set up some sort of common fund, whether it's funded by resources or taxes, doesn't matter, but people get some sort of... Uh, payout from that, I, I suppose. Um, my, my thought on that personally would be that I don't see that as an especially good remedy to the problem of economic unfairness, because the issue is not simply a matter of absolute living standards. Uh, it's, it's a matter of whether people are getting rewarded for their contributions, for the talent and effort. And that's something that, uh, you, you know, it can feel very frustrating. Uh, and it has to be solved much more by uh, complex policy inputs that enable somebody to get an education, to get where they need to go, to compete in the market, to compete in a way is fair and to be rewarded for the value they create. Uh, simply distributing wealth to people, um, you know, maybe it can help in other ways to create a, a baseline freedom from poverty, um, but I, I don't see it as a catch-all solution. Um, uh, there's a question by Juan Pablo Fontan who wants to know more about uh, measures of uh, social mobility. How do you go about measuring social mobility? What are your indexes for social mobility? Yeah, certainly. Um, so the main measure that we use in the book is something that in the academic literature is called intergenerational income elasticity. And the way that's computed is that you uh, essentially track uh, people and their parents um, longitudinally uh, over time. It's quite data intensive. And what you do is you compute, uh, you know, it, to, to sort of simplify things, you compute the, uh, the kids' income at a certain age and the parents' income at a certain, at that same age when, you know, back when those parents were the same age. And, and you check what's the correlation there. You, you know, there are these other things you need to correct for, uh, like life cycle factors, if somebody's still in school, things like that. Um, but essentially, it's, it's mostly that uh, parents, child, income correlation at the same age that we're using as a, uh, a measure of social mobility. Um, there are some other approaches that uh, uh, people use. For example, the World Economic Forum has a uh, more holistic approach to a social mobility index where they consider uh, what they think are relevant policy inputs to social mobility, things like uh, access to education and uh, you know, the price of housing, the competitiveness of the market and whatnot. Uh, but those are sort of indirect measures. So we, we feel in our book and in the quantitative work that it's best to home in exactly on, on that problem. Um, uh, very good. Um, we have another question in, in, the, in, in, in the chat by uh, Jose Hernandez. He asks, um, 
Do you think that the main problem is populist values endorsed by voters or authoritarian values embraced by voters and boosted by populist rhetoric? So is there, a, for instance, regarding anti-immigration attitudes, I mean, is it an anti-democracy and pro-authoritarian? I mean, um, uh, you know, when people want change, the status quo may, may in the checks and balances prevent change. Uh, and, and, and so people say, well, since I want change and democracy cannot deliver change, in some sense, let's get rid of democracy in, in the process. They need a populist rhetoric to justify that uh, that rage and that frustration with with the status quo. Yeah. So okay, there's a, there's I guess two ways in which I'd answer that. First is with just the definition of populism that we're working with in the book, which is that we're classifying it as anti elitism combined with anti pluralism. The sense that there's you know some corrupt elite that's rigging society. Uh, combined with, uh, you know, the sense that only my tribe has the right to make political decisions and that other people are illegitimate. But the way in which you get to that place, I, I think, is important and speaks to that, that question. And I would say that it's, uh, it's, it's a mix of those things. Part of the problem is that when you have a situation of economic unfairness, uh, we argue, is that, um, you know, you feel like you and perhaps your, your neighbors, your family, your community, you're not being fairly treated. You're not able to get ahead with talent and effort. And that causes people to look inward, you know, however flawed it might be, it's the human response to become more inward looking and uh, tribal and turn to their community as an uh, perhaps a somewhat anti-pluralist source of political authority. Uh, I certainly think, however, that that is exacerbated by the uh, particular political leaders who, who then, you know, show whatever direction that, that can go in. Um, I, I mean, you, you might contrast Donald Trump with other uh, political leaders in, in Europe, like, I, I don't know, you could even think of Nigel Farage or Boris Johnson, where uh, maybe there's a, a degree of, of quasi populism, uh, or, you know, even a degree of skepticism of immigration and things like that, but uh, certainly not any direct attempts at a coup. Uh, so I, I, I do think that it's a combination of those things. And uh, as the title of the book might suggest, Reclaiming Populism, uh, I, I think it's certainly possible to rechannel those concerns into a liberal democratic direction that uh, really addresses the substantive economic issues without going in a non-democratic direction. Very good. You made a, a very interesting point uh, in your presentation, quoting an article, I forget the authors, that the um, financial crises were different from regular recessions. In the, in the public's perception of their fairness. Uh, have you thought about uh, the perception of the pandemic? Uh, how is this recession, the pandemic, I mean, um, uh, uh, jive with your, your discourse and your framework? Yeah, so, I mean, okay, first of all, without even getting into the issue of economic unfairness, I think it's important to note that uh, certainly there's been a populist reaction to uh, the pan pandemic and, and the restrictions that come along with the pandemic, uh, perhaps in interesting and surprising ways. Uh, in you know, my home country of Canada, there is a huge convoy of truckers that are descending on, will have descended on Ottawa, uh, as you, you've probably read in the news, and, and people are essentially you know, saying, well, they're very populist. Is this Canada's uh, populist movement? Uh, so there, there's definitely an element of, uh, of that to begin with. And I, I would say that uh, that, first of all, comes from uh, certainly a sense of unfairness, however justified or unjustified it may be, uh, from those kinds of citizens where they feel that there are, you know, restrictions being placed on them uh, that, that uh, you know, they, they think are unfair. But I would add that, uh, you know, the, the trucker convoy into Canada has not made, for example, the country completely unrecognizable. It's not like this is spilled over into a broader grievance that resulted in something like Trump, where the US before and after is not the same country, or Brexit, where the UK before and after is not the same country. And uh, the, the reason for that is because it hasn't tapped into a deeper sense of economic resentment uh, that people can't get ahead on their, on their own talent and effort. I would add to that, though, that um, there is also an economic element uh, to the book or sorry, to, to the uh, pandemic, um, insofar as there's been uh, differential policy responses to it. You can imagine that uh, in some countries, uh, people have uh, had an easier time getting access to uh, monetary relief from the pandemic, uh, 
or an easier time uh, navigating all the you know, checks and balances surrounding vaccine certifica certification and masks and whatnot to be able to go and get back into the workforce. Um, so th there, there certainly is also an economic element of, of that that can play out. Yeah, very good. We have a, a couple of, of questions and I think we're running out of time, but, but let me state them. Uh, might the degree, uh, from Stefan Trim, uh, there's, um, he, he congratulates and asks, you know, does the degree of trust in government uh, uh, in cross-country comparisons uh, influence uh, toleration of unfairness or um, uh, can governments in some sense compensate for unfairness uh, or, and, and from Sinikda uh, Sony, uh, what if economic policies lead to the populism of the right as in India? where religion and caste equally affect social mobility. Is, is economic liberalization enough? Or, I mean, have you thought about the case of India where, where it's sort of like the resurgence of Hindu identity as, as, as a core definition of the nation is, is, is at stake vis-a-vis -a, -vis a more, uh, a more you know, uh, the, you know, Congress party approach, which was more ecumenical, if you want. Um, so, so those are our two last questions. Certainly. So uh, to answer the first of those with regard to trust in government, uh, in the quantitative analysis behind the book, we actually look at surveyed confidence in government from the World Gallup poll. And, uh, and, and we use that as a factor to investigate. And we say, well, what leads, um, uh, you know, some countries to have uh, higher confidence in government uh, versus lower confidence in government. So, so to begin with, I would say that that is an outcome variable that um, you, know, you can sort of use to proxy for populism. Other authors in the literature have certainly done that as a proxy for populism. Uh, in, in addition to that though, uh, I, I think that uh, to give a short answer, yes, there can always be country sort of fixed effects that uh, both change the shape that populism will take and perhaps can make it you know, slightly contained or slightly uh, slightly worse. Um, you know, for, for example, one interesting uh, country is uh, Switzerland, which uh, is such a, a, a bit of an oddball case because it simultaneously has relatively high degrees of uh, populist voting, but also relatively high degrees of uh, confidence in government and trusting government. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a, it, it, you, you can have interesting cases like that where um, you know, if you have better institutions and better trust in those institutions, uh, I, I think there, there probably can be, to an extent, a mitigating uh, effect. That being said, um, of course, once you've gotten to a point where people begin to lose trust in those institutions and begin to think of alternative arrangements, uh, you can very quickly go down a slippery slope into another situation uh, where you've got a historical precedent for illiberalism and that can carry on. Um, with regard to the question of India, I mean, um, you know, this is one of the reasons why we concentrated on the developed world in the book, because there's sort of a re reasonably uniform uh, value set across those kinds of countries. Uh, and and there's, there's not these huge issues of, of uh, uh, you know, for example, CASE, which uh, I completely agree with uh, you that um, CASE is a major inhibitor of uh, social mobility in India, and it's not simply a, a matter of um, you know, economic liberation uh, to, to do that. And that's, that's why, for example, in the tree of policy inputs um, that feed into uh, economic fairness and social mobility, you might recall that freedom from discrimination, both in law and in culture, was a critical input. And that's where that would be very, very relevant for the case of India. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Thanks, everybody, for uh, participating. Uh, this has been a, a really, I mean, uh, you've really thought deeply about all of these issues and, and know your own thoughts and the literature amazingly well. So congratulations, uh, a very, very interesting book and, and the great success with uh, its distribution. Well, thank you so much. And I want to thank uh, Ricardo, I want to thank Chuck, and I want to thank everybody in the audience for coming to the talk today. I hope this has been illuminating and a uh, reminder, you can get the book on Amazon, on politybooks.com uh, and at bookstores everywhere.